All right, this is your boy D on You Can Be Free with another video. I got uh, a good friend on today, Nicola, uh, one of the coolest people that I've met since I've been in Florida. She is from Jamaica and got a powerful testimony. Now, normally I get a little bit information from people about their story just to see if I can see if they're going to be a good fit. Um for this, you know, for this channel, make sure our beliefs are online and stuff like that. But she's so cool. She's so real. I just didn't even really need the information because I, I know her personally. So this is going to be my first time hearing a lot of this. So I'm excited to hear, but I'm just going to pass it to you. You can start from wherever you want to just feel free to uh, tell whatever parts of your story that you feel led to share. Hey. So um, thank you so much uh, for this platform um, and for um, the ears that will uh, be tuned in to hear and um, the lives um, that may be encouraged. So I'm Nicola. I'm originally from Jamaica. Um, came here at 17 years old. Uh, growing up in the island, born and raised in Jamaica. Born and raised, like we said. And um, with parents, uh, mom and dad, who exemplified um, what being uh, in love, being married, being uh, together, being believers are in their lives. So, so they, they, they just didn't talk it. They, they lived it simplistically as how we was raised, but nonetheless, they lived it. And so when I came here, um, my, my father and mother thought at the time when I was coming here, that it would be a good idea to give me the exposure to the United States of America, get me away from there because they figured, you know, there she was probably going to get in trouble all that, but I mean, nothing really great because, um, yeah, it started like hanging out a little bit with friends, still go school, but hang out and started getting into the whole boyfriend scene. And then uh, we started smoking weed. We call it marijuana. We call it ganja, right? Mm -hmm. Just is what them call it. Them grow the stuff. They, they, we got in it. And um, so... um. So when they brought me here to the United States, they said, well, we are bringing her to the land of opportunity because that's what we see it as being Jamaicans. Even until today, we see America as the land of opportunity. And so so when I came here um, and, you know, again, I grew up um, seeing them exemplify all of this in front of me. You know, I begin to, as a teenager, begin to ask God the question, who is this God? because that's what they introduced to me. So now that's their relationship. I needed to find a relationship myself, to have a personal relationship myself. So I began to ask God some questions. You know, I came in, it was a culture shock. I grew up poor. I didn't know it was poor. We knew it was comfortable, but seeing how they are here, we say, whoa, it is poor. So I, um, uh remember it being a culture shock because I remember stepping into like my aunt we go to her house and I step into her closet and I see all these shoes and my first question to my aunt is how many people is in this house you have like 30 pairs of shoes come to find out that was all hers and maybe a few of her husbands but mostly hers so growing up we had maybe three four pairs of shoes two for school two for church and maybe a slippers they wear in the yard. That was it. And uh, forget having a closet of your own. Didn't have that. So um, so anyway, we were here and um, trying to get, uh, a, a, you know, accustomed to the culture of being here. And uh, remember, um, had some things to happen. I'm going to say um, growing up had some things happen that my parents did not know about that I covered up, which was being introduced to sex at an early age. So the spirit of promiscuity was there. 
they did not know. And um, so that spirit attached itself, spirit of promiscuity attached itself and, and of course followed me throughout and I've never really um, shared that to them that the neighbor took advantage, the older boy and you know, it was then he brought in another boy and then it was all this. And so it was all these things that was happening to me that I never really faced. So I kind of stuffed it and just move on. So I came here and as I was um, moving through life, navigating through life in America, um, was trying to be follow one of my cousins that was here, end up being fast, as they say, and end up being um, date raped. Did not share that with anybody but my cousin at the time who told me don't tell anybody so she's telling me don't tell anybody so and me blaming myself going well is because I shouldn't have I shouldn't have followed her to this guy house who had another guy there and all this stuff so um so anyway just these different um bad experiences that was happening and and of course and I'm questioning you know, my spirituality for me, my sense of God, the direction and who am I and who are you, God? And my parents love you, who are you to me? And then I remember one night um, or one day just having kind of like what they call an experience where it was a vision where I seen myself as almost like I was dying. And this man came over me in white robe and he's floating over my bed. And I remember feeling like my spirit was leaving my body. And this man is floating over my bed. And he's holding his hands up with his hands raised. And um, I remember um, like he was showing me that he had got. And uh, I didn't remember the words, but I remember feeling like it was critical that I acknowledged him as God and um, it was that experience that I had was I was almost awake but asleep when I had that encounter and that's one of many encounters that I've had over the time and I've since then gone um, to got saved and everything and was into the, 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 the got into the ministry and was working in the ministry state um, Florida State Young People's Choir traveling all over the world. We did Bible Bowl. I would study the, because I grew up with the Bible. Like I grew up, the Bible is a part of our curriculum in Jamaica. So when people say, well, they, they learn in the 23rd Psalm, I knew it at seven years old. I knew it. Seven, eight years old, we knew it because it was part of the growing up in our curriculum. The Bible was. And so Psalm 1, Psalms 23, Psalms 100, just part of and um, so I did, and uh, when they would, would do Bible Bowl, it was nothing for me to study and, and know the word because the word was a part of us growing up. And so we won all these trophies and stuff. And um, so I remember, you know, doing all of that in the church and everything and getting to a point, a place in my life, I guess, where um, where the best way I could put it, now life start happening for real, for real. And so I ended up marrying a gentleman in, in the church that I met in the church. And I thought that he was um, safe, sanctified and filled with the Holy Spirit. Only come to find out said, um, he used to be, thought he was delivered from crack cocaine because that was his life before then, but he was in the church life of clean up everything. Got married and here comes the abuse. When we would argue, they would choke me, slap me around a little bit, right? But nonetheless, push me when we argue. So these things, um, you know, kept on happening. And I was like, again, um, questioning God because I didn't grow up seeing my mom in that. I didn't see my dad do that. So now I want to know, well, why do I need to stay with this? And what is this? You know, and... Uh, end up um, to get away from him um, joining the military. So when I went into the service, realized that I could do it. I got pregnant with my with our daughter. Then I went into the service. And when I went into the service is when I decided to leave from that marriage. And so I did, um, got away from that marriage. 
and um, went into a women's shelter for a little bit when I went to, um, still in the military, went to visit him at in, in, in the time he was living in Pennsylvania. We got into an argument because he didn't want me to leave him and didn't want me to leave with our daughter. So he decided to uh, beat me up then. And um, that's when I ended up in the women's shelter. So, um, so the military made sure that I was taken care of though and um, everything. And he um, then said, well, if you want to see our daughter, you have to drop charges. You have to drop charges. If you will, will not see her if you don't drop charges. And um, so I um, dropped charges against him. I had a protection from abuse order, dropped that because I want to see my daughter. So got through that and um, compromised, did that for him and um, got to see my daughter. The courts gave him primary physical, gave me partial physical custody. And I, because I was in the military, I stayed in the military, did well, um, but I ended up leaving out of that marriage. And um, at one point in the military, all that that was happening to me, the rape, the early sexual abuse when I was little and the, uh, the abuse that happened in the marriage, all of that was just compounding and compounding and compounding. I never really was dealing with any of it, right? So I um, ended up in a relationship when I was in the military that just really pushed me over the edge. And, um, you know, as a believer, I wasn't relying on God to bring me through that pain. I was um, relying on my own understanding. And so um, when that relationship went bad, I um, attempted to take my life when I was there in the military. And um, wasn't successful, thank God. And I remember the doctor sent me through therapy. And when I went through therapy and started dealing with all the stuff, it started coming out of all the things that I've dealt with that I, all the things that's happened to me that I never really dealt with. And so I had to start dealing with them, with the demons, so to speak, right? That was there. And um, I remember um, after going through that and kind of going through therapy, getting pregnant with my daughter left and just um, the military because of our motherhood and um, just um, came out and um, stayed in Georgia for a little while, stayed around in Georgia and um, decided to make that a home just for a little bit because I wasn't sure if I wanted to come back to Florida. But it wasn't until my dad passed away suddenly in Jamaica that I decided, okay, I'm going to leave Florida. I'm Georgia. I'm going to come back to Florida where I have some family. Really, most of my family then was in Jamaica. But I had some family here in Florida. So I want to pause there and see if, you, if I'm, you know, if you have anything, any. Before you, okay, so something interesting. You said a lot of interesting things, but you didn't know that before we did this video, I just did a video. They'll probably be posted Tuesday. And it was talking about leaning not on our own understanding. Mm -hmm. Now, I like how you acknowledge the fact that you were a believer, but mm -hmm. believers can go through situations. And when we're trying to do things in our own strength or figure things out, out without God, we can be in a place where we can be subject to the things of this world. And I just thought that was interesting how you had said that, um, not even knowing that I just did a video talking about <laughs> leaning not on our own understanding. But something else that you had said too, when you were with someone, I don't know if he was a minister in the church, but you had met him. This is a man in the church. So that's a point out for people, too, that just because you're with someone and they're calling themselves a Christian or they're doing stuff in the church, that do not mean that this person is walking upright or that don't mean that this person is going to be better than some a person that is not in the church or not in the church every Sunday. So I just wanted to point that out now where you're talking about, like right now at this point um, in your life, you're still in Georgia, correct? Or you said you was in Georgia and then you came back to Florida came back to Florida because of my dad's request was always, I'm always so far away from family because I would just travel. 
And I don't care if I don't know nobody there. I'm just going to go because that's just, you know, how I am. And so I, you know, me, I grew up in, in, in like the whole system, the whole being in around people that was believers and being around, you know, the scripture said having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. And so that's what I, I, so I know the whole thing, you know, I, I could go fast forward a little, a bit, you know, into going to my second marriage, second marriage, I met a man who was the co-pastor of a big church in uh, Miami. And uh, at the time I met him, I was in church myself, um, you know, walking the walk. And again, or I'm going to say, <clears throat> Yeah, I was walking a walk because I was serving in another ministry when I met him. And um, this man was directly under the lead pastor himself. So um, if I if I had a title for that period of my life, it would be it would it would be called for a book, it would be called Exposed. Hmm. Right? Because um the church that I've seen that I've come to know, all of it again, is just a matter of form. There wasn't any power. And um, so this man... Before and, you go forward, break that down a little bit when you say form but no power. Form and no power. You know, because um, so 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 how do I how do I say this? You know, I say um, form because uh we have gotten so used to being religious. Come on. Right? Mm -hmm. I think of the woman at the well. I want to use the woman at the well as an example because that was me. Right? Before my mom and dad, my grandparents served God. When she met Jesus, every day she would go up there. When she met Yeshua, his name, his Hebrew name, she would go up to the well for water to drink. Mm -hmm. would go because she felt thirsty she would go up she said and then they had a mountain that they would climb when they gathered that they would go up to think that they will meet the maker to meet their the 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 the, the god that they would always that they would look for so this is and how did that god look to her so this is what I we see happen with, with with the system of religion. The people are going and they're gathering and they're meeting, but God is not there. Right? Right. We remember David when they the ark was removed, and I love that teaching in the Old Testament. In the uh, you know, people say the Old Testament is done away. No, it's not. Because it's one book. That's right. So it, the people were carrying around the ark. I mean, the ark of the covenant, but the ark was nowhere present in in it. So this is what the system of religion religion has given the people. That's why we have people being, I I say, being beat up on, being whopped up when they have, you know, in this in this world. Because uh, they failed, right? The church has failed. Mm -hmm. You know, here's it. I had as somebody that was married to a man that was in the church that was a minister. And, you know, we're, we're, we're too busy making sure this person is sitting right here. And this person has to wear a dress a certain way. And this person has to look a certain way. And I, I would tell them when I got in there in my um, rebellious self, you know, I said, I'm not going to dress like that. I'm not going to sit there because I want people to know that I could be reached as a pastor's wife. I don't want people to think that I'm untouchable or unreachable. And so, um, again, you know, to, to this to this woman, the people are going every day. Nothing is happening and they're going every day and no change and no growth. And they're going every day and they're missing it, right? They're missing, they're missing who 
the true living water is. Mm. He, you're bringing, she's bringing the bucket in her hand every day to collect the water. She's bringing a bucket, but he's saying, I already given you, already got a bucket. I already got, you already have something inside of you that will collect what it is that I've given you. All you have to do is unlock it and drink. Right. But I'm so busy with that form because that's what I've seen from childhood, from my childhood. I've got to run to the church house because that's where it. But there is, but there's no power there to bring forth the deliverance. Come on, come on. Oh, so I've seen it in these men who are dressed. And like I would tell them, I said, listen, you, I'm not going to, don't give me Versace. And if you see me wear something with a name, I'm not going to wear it on my way to hell being in the church, sitting in the church. No. I said, if you're going to give me Versace, give me Gucci, and you wear it, I, I'm not going to wear it in sitting up in the in the pews going to hell. I just won't do it. And so you had, so I had to um, step away from the church at that time because the pastor himself was having an affair. And my husband at the time, my late husband was covering, was his alibi. And um, and I was very very disappointed, and um, and this is just not something that's new to the church. This is something that's happened over and over again. That people, you know, that they tend to instead of exposing it, they cover it up. Right. I told you if I had a title for this book, it would be called "Expose Expose It." Expose it, so that God could deal with it. And so time and time again, the woman would go because she's going to the well to drink the water, to the well to catch the water to drink, to the well to catch the water to drink. When what she was really looking for is not in that particular location, right? And she had that encounter with the well himself, the true living water. And he said, rivers of living water will flow from you because now you've had that true taste of who I am. Yeah. And when, and after she had that experience, if you, if anyone who's watching this, go back and read that story, the end of it, it says in the Bible, she left that water there. She left what she was carrying. And that's how it is. You know, when you really get a taste of the true living water, the his spirit, you leave all that other stuff behind. But like you said, I loved how you were talking about that's why we're going to get back to your story. But that's why I wanted you to stop, because a lot of times in church, we're just having a religious the Bible calls it a tradition of man where there's no change, there's no power, but a lot of people don't know the difference of really being touched by the power of God. But when that lady, when that woman at the well, when she got touched, she was carrying something. She left it there. The Bible says she left her yeah. bucket there. So I just wanted to, I wanted you to break that down. Uh, you did an excellent job explaining that, but mm -hmm. we can go ahead and get back to your story. She was, she, but she was carrying it. You see, she was carrying it. What she was carrying, she was care. She always, she always had. She was impregnated with, right? Mm -hmm. It's just that the seed was already, always, always, always been inside of her. That when life, when life come in contact, when the life, when the uh, ruach himself come in contact with the seed, something must happen. And so therefore it ignited what she already had on the inside of her. It, it ignited that seed that was already on the inside of her. And I take, and I say that for a good segue into where I went years later, I found myself because I had all the titles. I know what that's like to be the pastor's wife. God's not impressed with none of that. Right. So years later, I found myself incarcerated, right? Because I was straddling the fence. So now I found myself incarcerated, but this is what I but this is what I want everybody to get. I've been impregnated with the seed. The seed has been on the inside. 
the spirit himself ignited that seed when I got incarcerated. And so he asked me, he said, do you love me? And I said, yes, I love you, Father. He said, if you love me, feed my sheep. So I find myself in what could have been the worst situation of my life, now with the opportunity to minister his life to the woman on the inside. Okay, so let me stop you there. Now, we don't have to talk about what got you into the prison, but what I want you to talk about before we get to the point of you talking about your experience in jail is what was your life like before then? Because I've talked about on certain videos how we don't just jump into situations like that where we end up in jail or we end up in a certain situation. It's the small foxes. You know, it's just and it's certain things. So what was happening in your life that happened before you got there? Like what led to that, you think, or no? Well, I this this is what I I know. I know that I was in a relationship at the time with a married man that I had no business being with, end up being pregnant for this man. Okay, okay. Have to, have, ha, after having known better. And, um, but the flesh. I was being led by the flesh and I gave into that leading, that living. And so that brought me into, from just opening that door and so many others brought me into being um, incarcerated. And, um, and so when that happened, it was, uh, I was given a 15 year sentence and um, I remember saying or sensing in the, the, the um, flesh part of my mind is, this is it, I'm done. And I remember in the God being God and him being so mighty um, because the entire time that I was there, I remember fasting and praying and seeking him. And he said, feed my sheep. And so when I was going in and I had all these times, all this time, I lost everything going in, even the children. But I, one of the things I did faithfully when I was in the ministry is tithe. I always tithe and sow seeds. And our pastor had me tithe Isaiah 54, 13 and 14. And I was with tithe it. And everybody know Isaiah 54, 17. No weapon formed against me, prosper, prosper and every tongue that rises against me in judgment, thou shalt condemn. No, nope. Isaiah 13 and 14. No harm shall come to my household in, 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 in. In um, righteousness, they will be taught by the Lord, right? Fear nor oppression shall come near my dwelling. And so I'm tithing this, not knowing that I was tithing it for what's to come. And so when the courts step in and they wanted to, when they had called themselves taking my children, they wanted to scatter them everywhere. I would remind God, he said, remind me of my word. Put me in remembrance of my word. So I put him in remembrance of a word. I say, God, you said fear nor oppression shall come near my dwelling. And you said, great shall be the peace of my children. My children shall be taught by the Lord. God, you said. And so therefore, family stepped in. And everything was, and took the children. And they didn't have to be in the system. While I was there, I call it in Patmos, because that's what that was. But I realized in being in Patmos, when John was there in Patmos, he had so many visits. It's Patmos that I created from my decisions, right? But that Patmos was one of the fer more fertile soils I've ever seen in ministry. As I was there and I was going through, I remember getting 
um, my sentence and getting sentenced and being pulled from there into the county as I was um, there from the county. And one of the women looked at me and she said, I want you to come work with me because you must be a believer. And I said, okay, I didn't even tell her. She said, I got on the floor to work with them. And they said, you're the first one we hired from prison here in the jail. So the, um, I would work on the floor and started receiving so much favor with the captains and the sergeants. And I remember they used to come find me to pray and they would find this girl. They say, go let her pray because something happened. Something happened when she pray for you, with you. And so I would, I remember captains coming to find me and I would pray for them and everything and the church is coming in when the church is coming to give a service in the chapel and I'm there, they'll have me open in prayer. Some of them started having me deliver a word, um, depending on the leading. And um, I just remember that, I just remember it was such a fertile time that during the time when I was what could have been the most devastating point in my life end up being one of the most I, I said it, people say, what do you think God was dealing with, with you when you were there? I said, here's what I knew that he was dealing with. It was not the fruit that he was dealing with. But you know, fruit grows on tree. When the fruit grows on the tree, the fruit go come and drop off the tree. The people eat the fruit, the, people, the fruit gone. You are here at the time when the tree grow, you don't see any fruit, but you know the tree is there. The tree is still the tree that has that fruit. What God was dealing with me was, is the root of that tree. Mm -hmm. He said, your roots need to be dealt with. I said, okay, Father. So in that time, as he was dealing with the root, he said, your root need to be firmly planted in the soil. So therefore comes whatever may in your life. Your roots from this point forward will never be the same in your life. And people will know. He gave me the scripture to back it. Isaiah 61, 3. An oak of righteousness a planting of the Lord for the display of his splendor. So what you're talking about dealing with the root, I teach that when it comes to deliverance, because like you said, a lot of times people are dealing with the fruit. These are the symptoms of certain mm -hmm. things that are going on in the life, but we got to get down to the root and Sometimes that can be a painful process because if I was to go to the doctor and I have headaches and stuff like that, you know, uh, I'm vomiting and all that, those are symptoms. But if I had the, the flu, you know, that's how they know how to treat it because this is the root, you know what I mean? And then roots can be up on roots because all of this could be coming from something like you know, that is even deeper than the flu, like my um, eating lifestyle or whatever else. But there's some, I went through deliverance dealing with some roots of some addiction issues and come to find out that was like, you know, I had to go all the way back to childhood. Now, <laughs> what was your process like of deliverance? I'm about to ask you two questions. Um, I want you to just talk for a couple of, you know, minutes, however, about your process of deliverance, what that was like, and then what has life been like since, you know, jail, since deliverance now? Like, what has life been like since God has took you through this deliverance? And so I had to come in, I had to come face to face with, so that time allowed me to come, when, when you have so much time, when you were given that time, you, you can't help but to reflect. And so... There, so I remember he put me around some mighty, mighty women of God, Lori Roberts, Debbie Day, and I call my mama, 
my white mama, I call her, Letha James, that was there to see me, you know, Catherine um, Jones, Catherine Williams. I mean, people that mighty, mighty women of God who just didn't have the form, but they were truly connected to the spirit of the living God. And so he began to bring that deliverance in and, and that began to happen. And I began to look, go back to my childhood and see where there was things that from the spirit of promiscuity and even though that abuse had happened that, oh yeah, that aunt, you remember when you were growing up, she used to have like many men that she's entertaining come and go from her house. And, and I mean, he started having me to trace back in the family tree to see where the connection was with that and to see how did that come in? And so this is what I what I wanted to mention. You know, people say, well, okay, they got saved. What they have to remember, and this is one of the things that I remember teaching so fervently on the inside was that we are tripartite beings, spirit, soul, and body. So our spirit man becomes alive, become aw awoken, but then there is the soul. And in the soul, it has, and it carries within it so much things that it's gotten that need to be uprooted, that need to be delivered out of the soul so that the oneness could happen with as tripartite beings with the spirit, soul, and body. And until that happens, then Houston, we have a problem. And heaven, heaven have a problem because heaven then can communicate with us like, like he's supposed to, as they're supposed to, right? The, the Ruach, the Holy Spirit, God, Yah, Yahweh, Jehovah, Yeshua, Amashiach himself cannot communicate with us because there is this wound. There is these things that we're carrying in our soul and it cannot communicate. But this is the thing. So then before I came, that was so loud. The soul was. The spirit man didn't, I wouldn't take the commands from him. But the beauty of it is when I got the deliverance, now the spirit man began to be louder than the soul. And now I see where the soul itself now needs the deliverance. Need, oh, yeah, that needs to, to stop because, um, yeah, okay, that's a wound that's there bring that out because then you can't walk in wholeness or can't deliver wholeness to someone else if you're truly not walking in wholeness yourself right being delivered you know mm -hmm. and so you ask you know how has life been since the incarceration god is i, I would say god is good but that uh, that's a cliche that does not even begin to describe the mightiness of my mind cannot even begin to fathom that after losing everything to see him restoring everything back together again in my life where my children are all back in my life things that I thought I've lost is coming back into my life when I was incarcerated I think I shared a little bit of this story I had a mentor that I met in there and then she said, okay, she wants to bring a teaching program in and she brought this college program in and then they chose me for the college program because I was a part of the chapel and I got a part of the program and was able to, we were able to get like 20 of us was able to get our, our degree and uh, four of us got our masters and to see him, you know, the professor said, okay, now I want you to teach. And um, so they title me in there and I'm going, okay, you know, associate professor and I'm teaching the women while I'm incarcerated, college level biblical classes. And, um, 
you know, that same degree when I'm home and I met a woman on a path on one day walking in a park, that same degree God used to land me as a school teacher or a private institution, a private a Christian um, elementary school, or uh, it was mixed because it wasn't just elementary um, Christian academy that um, allowed me to teach fifth and sixth graders um, every lesson every there is. And so, you know, and I've seen them many more doors open since then, you know, with the, the, just the magnitude, the mighty move of God. Yeah. And the favor of God is on your life. You know, uh, so much to, so I see you a lot because of, of work. And, uh, I remember when you had mentioned, about you being incarcerated, I might have smiled or laughed because sometimes I'll be laughing at the wrong stuff. But the reason why is because I just can't. I'm like, you don't even sound right talking about being locked up. Like, you don't look like, and that's how good God is. He will clean you up in such a way you won't even look like what you have been through. Hallelujah. You know, and um, you just have this, this light you know, that, that I'm drawn to, and I'm so glad that you weren't there because people get on my nerves at work, you know, <laughs> but it's just like, there's a piece, you know, but just, you know, there's a piece that you, uh, that you carry and there's also wisdom. And we were talking about fear. Uh, I think it was a couple of weeks ago. And I actually did a video on fear last week. And for people that are dealing with fear about situations that they feel like are not going to work out in life or for people that are going through some things right now, and it just seems like it's just not getting better. It's getting worse. And they have this fear on their life or even fearing of old things coming back. What advice or what word do you have for someone that is dealing with the fear of failure? Right, right. Um, you know, and, and, and believe in that, that thing will come back. You know, one of the things I always remember is when Yeshua went to the cross. When Yeshua went to the cross, it said for three days, you know, he was in the belly of the earth. And we can't even begin to fathom what, what's, what's in the belly of the earth for three days. Because we have to remember that we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, right? And so what we what we wrestle with is spiritual, right? It's not, it's not carnal. Mm -hmm. It's spiritual. And so therefore, and when I say we, the spirit world, because people have to remember there is a spirit world. Be sensitive to that. There is a spirit world. He went three days down in the belly of the earth. And he went not to wrestle, but I believe he went to kill every, to slay every, with just his presence, slay every demon there is in that spirit world, right? In in the way of like, nope, you can't have authority. Nope, drugs, you don't have authority. Nope, promiscuity, you don't have authority. You know, nope. No nope. uh, spirit of molestation. You don't have authority. You can't have authority. You know, you name it. Spirit of backbiting. You don't have authority. Gluttony. You don't have authority. You name it. Whatever that spirit is, you don't have the authority over that individual anymore because Yeshua for three days did it. And when he, listen, he did before he went on the cross, he, he, and went down, he said, it is finished. It is finished. He didn't say to be continued. Then I'm going to wrestle, go back down and wrestle. No, he said, it is finished. And so that's one of my driving forces in my spirit. If, if Yeshua said it is finished, and then he's announcing to the atmosphere, because he's that heaven that's here on earth as a witness, because he said heaven and earth must witness for it to come to pass. So therefore the witness came, right? And and he declared it as heaven's witness. He declared it in the flesh as earth witness. He declared and said, it is finished. That is what he declared from the beginning. So he's saying now it is done. 
complete. It is finished. The witness, heaven and earth is now witnessing it. Now he said, every knee shall bow. He said, not only am I going to declare this here, he said, I am now going to go to hell so that hell could bow. And that's what he did for three days. Everything in hell was bowing. So therefore, heaven, earth, and hell, all three, right, was that witness. Had to agree, had to come in agreement. Whether they agreed or not, had to agree that he is. And he is, says, it is finished. Not to be continued, it is finished. So therefore, every spirit of addiction, every spirit must come under that obedience. Come on. Amen. I feel the spirit of God just all over you. It is coming through the airways. That was powerful. That was powerful. I, um, I'm just blown away with that. So I do got another question. Um, but I'm still just, <laughs> I was still just, you hit me. You really did. You hit me for real. I wasn't expecting all that. That was powerful. That was so powerful. My last question is, um, for anybody who's watching this, who has um, gone through some of the things that you are, that you have went through and have overcome, you know, what closing words do you just have some, for a person that may still be there? You know, um, just any closing words that God has given you right now. Right. You know, because there is there is days when the enemy, I'm not even going to mention the enemy. There is days when in myself, I feel like this is a lot. But then I remember scriptures that he said, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Take that. Take my yoke upon yourself. Remember that, that you're not carrying that. We have to learn to rely on the Holy Spirit the Ruach HaKadosh in the Hebrew word. We have to learn to rely on him and let him be our guide as we go through our daily, this daily life that I said that we're just having an earthly encounter because really we are, once we come into the knowledge of who he is, we are spirit beings having this earthly encounter mm -hmm. and we have to remember his burden is light take it give it to him don't try to do it yourself rely on this the, the the systems that he has placed around you don't be afraid to call somebody up if you have somebody that you know that you could just lean into and they're going to let you be yourself as you get past that pain, that hurt, that whatever it is that may be. Lean into them and share with them whatever it is that may try to hold you back, whether it be yourself or even the enemy may try to hold you back. And Amen. You said, you just said it. And you also said this earlier in the video, and this is something that I want people to catch. I actually was just telling a friend this, and I'm going to uh, send this to her as soon as we get finished recording, because your words was powerful. I want to thank you for your time. This blessed me. But what you said, call someone, call a friend. And then you also was talking about when you was in prison, how you had these women, you know, uh, 
that to help you through this situation. And these was real women. They just didn't have the form, but they had the power. And for men and women that will see this and you may be in a situation in your life, no matter what the situation is, if you're dealing with addiction or if you just need God to restore some things, having the right people in your life is so important. People that are real, um, people that are people that you can you can trust. And I'm not, we have talked about religion, the difference between having a form of godliness for people that are actually really caring this power. Um, but I tell people time after time after time, do not try to walk this thing out on your own. Cause I've seen this with people. They will be in it by themselves as lone rangers and they're struggling and they find themselves back in the same situation time after time after time. So having the right people in your life is everything. And if you don't have them, pray for the people because God will provide everything that you need. I want to thank you again for your time. Like I said, this blessed me. I'm going to have to watch this again myself. And I'm going to close out as I always do. No matter what you're going through, no matter what you're dealing with, just know that you can be free because who the son has set free is free indeed. We love y'all and we are out.